Um, and I'm from Dakota County. Thank you, Secretary. I appreciate it. Um, Secretary Collins. Good morning, Jonathan. This is Washington County Public Health and Environment. Catherine Drake, I'm the Commissioner of Research. 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 Research.
uh, doing in-depth interviews with airmen in, uh, in uh, northern Japan for the U.S. Air Force. That was kind of fun. Uh, doing a little bit of election polling for men post. That was kind of fun. Uh, but the best thing is working with other researchers. And that's what I really enjoy doing is uh, working with teaching. I do uh, some teaching at the Humphrey School right in the middle of the semester right now on a course on survey methodology and uh, data collection. And so you're going to profit from some of the slides that I use in some of my lectures. Um, I've updated some of that, and the structure of my uh, talk today basically is going to be, okay, can you believe the polls? And if so, why? And then the second part is going to be, okay, what have we learned, mainly about questionnaire design, and web, especially web questionnaire design, and um, enhancing response rates over the last few years? And I'm going to rely on my old friend Don Billman, uh, who, many of, who uh, many of you have his first or second book, edition books in your bookcases at work. Uh, he just came out with a new book, the 2014 edition. I forced all my uh, master's students to uh, buy that book so that they'll have it on their bookcases in another three years when they need to do a survey. Um, and much of the things that, many of the things that I'll be talking about today came from uh, so that's a little bit about it. Again, as we go along, if you have any questions, just uh, uh, catch my eye and we'll talk about it. Uh, and I'll save the long answers. To, let's see, where do I point this? I don't know anything about machinery. No, that's not. Oh, there we go. There we go. Well, we all know what our poll, what polling disasters we've had in the past. Everybody's familiar with this, and she's familiar with the Liberty of Digest disaster in 1936. Where um, they said Alf Landon the, the, was going to win, um, at least the Literary Digest did. Gallup, who had just started polling, said, nope, it's going to be Roosevelt, 56%, 44%. And when the election results came out, uh, Roosevelt won with 61%. And we all know from our classes in survey methodology why that happened. They had a skewed sampling frame. They used a sampling frame that was too heavy on high-income voters, mainly Republicans, because they got their frame uh, in addition to their own uh, mailing list, their own subscriber list, from telephone books. And who could afford telephones in the 1930s? Just the rich people. So we know what happened there. Fast forward to 1938, you'd think we learned from 1936. But no, no, we didn't. In the 1948 presidential election, Crosley, Gallup, and Roper were all polling. The candidates were Harry Truman, Mr. Dewey, and those were the outcomes there. Uh, what happened then? What happened then? Well, in early, late 1948, early 1949, there was such a hoo-ha, that's a technical term that I'm sure you all <laughs> appreciate. There was such a hoo-ha about this that uh, a, a commission was appointed to investigate the problem. And what did they find? Well, they found a number of different things. Uh, one of the people that sat on this, uh, this uh, panel was Samuel Stauffer, a, a really well-known sociologist who did a lot of work surveying the military uh, during and after World War II. Um, but Frederick Mosteller was the chief author of the report, and basically they concluded that non-probability sampling, uh, methods of non-probability sampling were partly at, 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 uh, at fault. But one of the big things was that uh, because there were no such things as telephones, or not very many people had telephones back then. And we didn't have the data collection methods, caddy interviewing and web surveys and things like that, where you get instant feedback. Most of these organizations came out of the field in early October just so they could tally the information by hand, send it by telegraph to the central place. That's telegraph, you know, one line, 
that goes from here to here. And you've got to know the dots and dashes and things like that. Anyway, uh, there were a lot of things going on. But the biggest problem was that they were using quota samples. And that's all well and good if you know what the probabilities are in the clusters where you're drawing your quotas or setting your quotas. They did. They guessed. They were wrong. So um, to backtrack a little bit, um, why did I pick this title? Well, if, if you recall your history, uh, when European kings died uh, and another heir to the throne came along, they said, Vive, and my French is terrible, Vive le Roy, long live the king, le Roy et mort. The, the king is dead, long live the king. Well, what we've had over the past number of decades is about every is every few years. The last big was big one was in 1996. But every few years, something happens that says the survey is dead. It's no longer reliable. We're going to have to figure out a better way of gathering information than surveys. It happened in 36. It happened in 48. It happened in 1996 when many. Uh, many polling units uh, way overestimated uh, Clinton's support. Pollster John Zogby was uh, right on the money. He was brand new at this stuff. Reuters had hi just hired him and um, he was lucky. He was, he was very lucky and he did very well and he's really capitalized on that. Um, I'm going to try and make the case that if we use the best practices, that means probability samples and not non-probability samples, like opt-in panels, for example. And if we do as much as we can to reduce subtotal survey error, and I'll talk about what all the components are in just a minute. If we use all of those principles, the principles of probability sampling, reducing uh, bias through addressing total survey error and doing that by using best practices in the industry. If we do all those things, then we too can get really accurate results. Now, everybody likes to say, well, how accurate is accurate? If you went to the web the day after the New Hampshire primary, that'd be the day. <laughs> and you looked at Huffington Post and at 538.com, Nate Silver's website, which is no longer Nate Silver's website. It belongs to ESPN, but we won't go there. Um, and you looked at the polling averages, subtracting the second place numbers from the leading candidate on the Republican side, there'd be a difference of 16.3 according to HuffPost, and 17 on 538, a little bit of difference, not too much, and they were identical for the Democrats, Sanders and Clinton. What were the actual, what was the actual spread? Well, just this morning, according to Politico, it was 16.1, 60.1, All right. Is that right? Did I do that right? 19.6 for the Republicans. Yeah. So we're pretty close here and not too far off there, given the margin of sampling error that you associate with, with polls. So our polls did not too badly in Iowa. I mean, I'm sorry, in, in uh, New Hampshire, uh, on the Republican side, most polls got the order wrong. They got the leader right, but the order wrong. But overall, they didn't do too badly, unlike uh, unlike Iowa, where there were a few issues. We can stay around and talk about that. I don't want to get into them right now. Um, I've got a good friend named Cliff Zukin. You may have heard of Cliff. He's the, uh, he used to run the statewide poll in New Jersey, the Rutgers University poll, he preceded me by uh, a 
year as president of ACOR, the American Association for Public Opinion Research. And last summer, he wrote an article for the New York Times that basically said the first line in my title, or at least he hinted at it, polls are dead. He said uh, low response rates are really problems. You know, if you do, I don't know what kind of survey work that most of you do, probably web-based, but if you do RDD uh, phone surveys, random digit dial phone surveys, you know there's a really big challenge right now. Landlines are the cheapest way to go about doing those surveys, but what happens when we find out that 43% of the United States are cell-only households? All of a sudden you've got uh, you've got a huge chunk of population that you can't get by landlines. You don't know if they're, uh, you can't build a sampling frame from email addresses because you don't know their email addresses exactly. And so how do we get in touch with them? Well, that's one challenge. Another challenge is non-response. What do you think the average response rate to RDD phone surveys are? Anybody want to guess? That's pretty close, yeah? It's not that bad. We seem to have reached a, a, a floor. Uh, I, on the national and statewide RDD surveys that I do, I'm getting response rates that range anywhere from or to about 10 or 11 percent. Uh, Pew, uh, the Pew Research Center, uh, one of the best in the nation, they get around 5 to 9 percent right in that range. And so when you've got an inability to reach people in your sampling frame, hi, welcome, find a chair, yeah. Uh, and the people that you do get don't want to talk to you. They, I can see where Cliff said, yeah, we've got a serious problem. And we do. We really, really do. Now, I, I talked to uh, one of you guys earlier, and you do surveys of um, licensees. And the way the survey is done, if I understand it correctly, is that they pay the fee, they, maybe there's a test involved or some sort of, of, uh, of uh, something goes on, and then you get the survey. Well, that, that's great, but what, who was it that was talking to me about this? Yeah. And she was saying, maybe the better way is to say, take the survey before you pay the fee and get recertified. <laughs> hey, that's a great idea. I like that. That's, that's really good. But there are other ways to reduce non-response which I love dearly, and I'm going to talk about those later on. So we've got some challenges. How do we deal with phone surveys where we can't reach people, and people, when we do reach them, are likely to say, go away, don't go away, man, just go away. Some of them actually say, you go to hell, you go straight to hell, do not pass go, do not collect $200, I'm not going to talk to you, and don't call me back, and put me on your do not call list. Well, the problem there is that Best practices say that we should, as researchers, maintain a do not call list, but as researchers and not telemarketers, we don't have to. So there are all, all kinds of things that we can do. Cliff was right. Things are in flux. We're really uncertain right now. We've got uh, difficulty in modeling a likely vote, uh, electorate. Dual frame RDB samples are costly. It costs about twice as much to do a phone survey now as it did in 2008. Cell phones, on the average, cost anywhere from two to four times as much per interview as a landline cell phone survey. We're experimenting with probability panels in electoral uh, in electoral polling. Uh, there's a new one this year, uh, NORC, N-O-R-C, the University of Chicago has a probability panel. Gallup has had one in the past. Um, Pew has one uh, now, and I think uh, 
College Networks has had one for a good while. All of those have problems and we're still under, trying to understand how to better use them in uh, pre-election polling and in market research. That's the bad news and there's a lot of it. But what I'm going to do or try to do in the next few minutes is make the case that everything is not going to hell in a handbasket, that we do see a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train, and that we can all help each other. So what I'm going to do is show you a little bit about what's happened in the past, and then I'm going to start talking, like right now, about what we know about how accurate surveys can be. In 2012, there was a symposium at um, Stanford's Institute for Research in the Social Sciences, University of North Carolina, is one of those also. Uh, but at Stanford, John Krosnick and some other um, luminaries in the methodological field got together and said, okay, what are some of the things that we know and what are some best practices? A lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today is taken from that. One of the things that uh, Krosnick reported on, he looked at accuracy of surveys. He matched, uh, he, he looked at some work that respondents, uh, where respondents had self-reported on a survey and they had in objective individual reports of the same phenomenon. What's an example of that? Well, uh, where you say, have you smoked cigarettes in the past week? And then they take a blood test. So they would know these things. We're going to look at the evidence from the second thing, one-time aggregate survey percentages and means with benchmarks from survey data. So let's take a look at that. There, there were other things too. Um, and this study that Krosnick reported on had more than a thousand instances of validation against objective data. Now this is objective data, not attitudinal, not perception, not opinion, but objective measures. These survey estimates just span the actual uh, gamut. Everything from alcohol use to voter turnout. But wait a say, how can you actually validate against voter turnout when our ballots are supposed to be secret? Well, that's true. You can't. Here in Minnesota, they are. But if you know what you're doing, you can go to the secretary's office and you can download the voting record of all registered voters for the past eight years. If you make meet one of, uh, if you meet all three of the requirements by state law. And so you can actually go through, and we did this after every election at the Star Tribune, and validate your likely voter model. What worked and what didn't work when it came to measuring likelihood to vote. And that's what this study did. So are self-reports really accurate? Ford and others in 1997 asked whether or not the woman had smoked before uh, pregnancy and the survey, whoops, survey mean, yeah, I told you I could not break <laughs> uh, Survey mean was 31%, the objective mean was 31.3, not a very large difference. And you're going to say, okay, that's fine, those are old data. What about newer ones? In 10, Frauke Kreuter and others asked respondents whether they were currently employed and there was only one percentage point difference between the objective measures and the real and the survey reported data. So this is just a little bit of evidence. If you're interested in all of the other stuff, see me afterwards and I'll give you the citation for it. But we know that survey measures can be pretty accurate. What happens when perception is different from reality? when perception about your poll is different from reality about your poll. In 2004, I had one of those happenstances. 
It was a lot of fun. <laughs> In uh, March, we published our first pre-election poll. It showed something like a double-digit lead for Kerry over Bush. And one of one of the uh, groups on the uh, end of the partisan spectrum just went absolutely nuts. I could use the more colloquial term for that, but let's just say they went nuts. They didn't like that at all. And for them, that was the uh, basically the straw that broke the camel's back. They started writing blog entries about how biased the Star Tribune was, and how evil and loathsome and incompetent and biased the pollster was. And we went through the summer with that same sort of thing. Every few months, we we do a survey and published the results and got the same reaction. I came to work one September morning uh, right uh, after Labor Day but before our, our September poll was published and found our Vice President for Communications uh, had left the message for me, Rob come see me when we get in. And he told me that there was going to be a protest out in front of the building and that I was going to be the subject of the protest and um, just wanted to let me know about it. And I said, well, that's fine, man. I'll take some orange juice and coffee and cookies out to him. He said, trust me, that really doesn't work. Um, <laughs> you let us handle this. You go do your daily run. I was running uh, back then. And uh, you come back and we'll, we'll uh, I'll tell you what happened. Well, I got pictures of it. and. Rich Warren wrote a piece in the Washington Post about it called it Smash Mouth Politics in Minnesota. And it's all because of this misperception or perception on among some partisans that the poll was biased. Let's see about that election here. Final 2004 election polls in Minnesota. Here was the St. Cloud State poll, October 17th through the 26th. They had carry up by seven, uh, seven. The Humphrey School poll had Bush up by three. We had one Minnesota poll in late October that had carry up by eight. That was the Tuesday through Friday before the election. Rasmussen had carry up by one. Gallup had carry up by eight. Strategic Vision had it at a tie. And I'm going to come back and talk about strategic vision in just a sec. Um, the Zogby tracking poll had carry up by six. Our final Minnesota poll had carry up by four. Kerry actually won by 3.5 percentage points. My editor wrote me a note after the election and said, so do you think they're ever going to apologize? <laughs> and the answer, of course, is no. So what's happened since then? In 2008, uh, this is a little bit different format, and I apologize for that. You know, if I'm a child of the 60s, long-term memory and, and such, um, I do different formats, just have, just whatever happens to uh, be right at the, at the, at the moment every, every four to eight or four years when I do these things. Uh, the most accurate polls were the Star Tribune Minnesota poll. They were only two and a half percentage points off on average over two elections. Uh, so was YouGov Polymetrics poll. It was a web survey. The worst two polls were St. Cloud State and the Big Ten Battleground. Uh, the overall average error was for about five points, not real great. In 2012 nationally, the actual vote showed um, the Democrat won by 3.7 percentage or percent, and the uh, I think the average that the polls had was 1.4 percent. So overall, the polls were off in their estimates, only a little over two percentage points. Not too bad, especially when you have polls doing one thing at time one and campaigns doing 
whatever they can do, all the money they have, to prove your poll wrong if they don't like the results. In 2012 in Minnesota, things looked pretty good. Um, Obama won by eight points. The best, most accurate poll was PP, the PPP poll out of Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, generally doing work for Democrats. He had, they had Obama at eight points. Uh, the worst one was a Republican, the American Future Fund. Uh, they had Romney at one. The average error was 5.8. So overall, we were about two and a half, uh, three points difference there. Not too bad. When you consider all of this royal and muddiness and campaign activity and get out the vote activity in a campaign. So the point I'm making is the polls still do a pretty good job. You got to be careful who you look at. But over the past three or four election cycles, we've been able to see, or uh, we've been able to say, okay, any given poll is really okay if you want to track changes from time to time. But if you really want the best estimate of what's going on right now, the best way to do that is average all of the most recent polls. Mm -hmm. Back on the former side, do you know to what extent um, the PPP was um, more accurate because they had such a higher sample size, or was it something in how they did their sampling? Uh, it was how they do their sampling, and, and uh, actually, uh, it was more on how they do their weighting okay. because they're uh, they're an opt-in uh, panel. Uh, um, pollster, they do opt-in panels, and so when they first started doing doing their work several cycles ago, they had wild swings. Sometimes they'd be fairly close and other times they'd be way off. Uh, and they finally figured out how to how to how to do the analysis on the back end. Yeah. So for the average researcher, right, we don't have polls out there looking at what we are in position about the things we want to understand, right? So what are the implications of this average poll for our world? Yeah. Um, you don't have those different uh, a lot of different people with, or a lot of different organizations with different house effects and different methodologies and different ways of defining uh, or modeling likely voters and different wording with the different wording of questions. You don't have that. Right. And in that way, we're handicapped a little bit. But, and I'm going to make this point a couple of times uh, in the next 20 minutes or so, as long as we cue to the things that we were trained to do, and that is take the probability sample and use best practices. Yeah, occasionally we're going to get stumped. But what's the alternative? Yeah, I don't think so. You guys have seen this. All you got to do to do good research is have quality. It's going to cost you a little bit. And you can do it very quickly. That's the good news. <laughs> you can have all three. Uh, if you pay enough money, you can have all three. Generally, we can only pick two at a time. We can't always have the fastest turnaround. Yes, I can do an overnight survey. I've done those before. But we sacrifice a whole lot because of that. Yes, I can have a quality survey and have speed, but I'm going to pay out the end yang for it. If I want to cut costs, then I'm going to have to suffer in terms of speed or quality. That's the problem we often work end up with. We as survey researchers have to balance variance and bias. If we want a large sample size, we can decrease the variance. And we can get enough interviews to weight it properly on the back end so that we decrease bias. But when we do our weighting, we introduce design of that, which increases the variance. So often what we have to choose from is going to, just like speed, quality, and price, we often, ha often have to choose between <coughs> variance and bias as well. You guys have seen one of this, and most of you probably have 
at least a version of it etched in your mind. The reason I put this flow chart up is to formalize something called total survey error. It is a way of looking and looking at and approaching doing a sample survey. We can have problems anywhere along in here. If you don't work with the client, whether it's internal or external, external well enough to articulate exactly what the objectives are, you're going to have specification error up here. And I've made every error there is. I, I, I screwed up every possible way there is to screw up. So I, I know how this works. One of our, when I was doing advertising research in North Carolina in the 80s, uh, one of our, uh, our internal client always wanted a certain list of demographics because uh, they wanted to know whether shopping at Kmart and reading the newspaper were correlated, and if so, what were the Kmart shoppers? Well, you know, you know the drill. Well, guess what? I forgot to do one. I forgot to put marital status on the questionnaire. Stupid! It was really dumb. And I screwed up that way, and I, I made my share of mistakes all along the way. The point I'm making is that there's a lot of ways that we can make mistakes, but if we know how to catalog this and how to think about reducing error, then we can do that. And one of the concepts, um, we use, most of us uh, who are of a certain age went through <coughs> our training where we had to learn about face validity and external validity and internal validity and all those kind of great terms. And those are fine to know about. But that's been supplanted by another way of thinking about things. Basically, error in survey comes from two buckets. One of them is random error, and the other is non-random error or bias. And when I say bias, I don't mean you're biased, you're a bad dog, wrong, bad, 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 bad. I don't mean that kind at all. Random error or sampling error simply comes from taking a probability sample and not interviewing the entire universe. The other sources of error are non-random error bias. I've already talked about specification error. Coverage error. If our sampling frame either has the wrong people in it, and we survey people who shouldn't be surveyed, or it doesn't have the right people in it, and we omit folks that should, should have been surveyed and we don't, then we're, we are likely or could have coverage error. Non-response error we know about. Measurement error. That may be a term that some folks are not familiar with. Measurement error is essentially a couple of examples of that. Context effect in questionnaires, order effect, and um, question wording. Think about the wording we use. All of us are very careful wordsmiths when we do our surveys. Something as subtle as this. United States of America. Something as subtle as that can really affect the outcome, especially if you're doing public policy type issues. Data tabulation error. Um, to err is to human. To really screw things up requires a computer. <laughs> if you've got a sample size of, I don't know, let's pick a number, 15,000, nice big sample, low variance, maybe. But what if you use the wrong ratio weights when you're correcting for unequal probabilities of selection? You're screwed. No other way about it. And of course, analysis error, there are all kinds of that. Uh, I, I tell my students, we don't have time to talk about measures of association, but if you, you're using the wrong level of measurement, say a nominal or ordinal level of measure, and you're trying to do a regression analysis, it doesn't work. You need a different level of measure for that.
Okay, a little bit of intellectual break here, a little test. I don't want to see a show of hands, but think to yourself. Okay, I'm the sampling statistician here. What kind of sampling method would you use? We have all kinds of ways to do this. We have an Epsom equal probability of selection, a random sample. We have a stratified sample. We have uh, a multi-stage cluster sample based on an area design. We have a telephone. We have all kinds of telephone sampling techniques. And we have uh, systematic sampling with a random start. This is not a test. I'm not going to ask you here. How about here? This, by the way, um, this was a refugee camp in Kosovo. This is southern Somalia. What kind of, I can't tell it from the, uh, but these are huts, these are people, these are paths, roads. Um, what kind of sampling would you use here? There's no list of the population. You can't build a sampling frame very well. How about here? Everybody's got a telephone, or at least most people do. We actually know how many people live in each county. We can actually build a stratified sample. We can do a dual frame, random digit dial, telephone survey. I can tell you what the survey researchers used here. They used a multi-stage cluster design. And here they used, because the temps were ordered, and they knew the exact number in each one, and they knew the number of people who lived in each one, they did a systematic sample with a random start. Mm -hmm. OK. So how do we approach this method of minimizing our total survey error concept. One star methodologist says we need to employ the social exchange theory. Everything we do, whether it's questionnaire design or whether it's communicating with respondents uh, through our initial email when we're trying to get them to click on the link and go to the web survey or any subsequent communication, we need to do two are three things uh, that are embedded in something called the social exchange theory. We need to increase their rewards. Now often, <coughs> that's those rewards when we're trying to reduce non-response, but many times it's psychological rewards. We, we try to reduce their costs. That's almost never this, because they aren't going to do it if it costs money. But it does cost them in terms of cognitive stress and in terms of time and other things. And the first thing we need to do as researchers is establish trust. Now, you guys who work for government have it easy. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, he's okay. He's okay. I mean, what are you doing? You're representing Dakota County. <laughs> State of Minnesota Health Department. We look out for your health. What about us poor independent researchers? <laughs> hey, we just want your opinions here. You've never heard of us. What does it mean to you that we're asking for your opinions on whatever? Whatever we can do to reduce costs, <laughs> increase trust, and build in a reward system, even if it's just psychological. Make the questionnaires fun. Make them short. The former director of the U.S. Census has another additional way of doing that. He said, make it salient. Make it important to the respondent. What is their hot button? How can you do that? What's a concrete way of doing that? You tell them what it's about up front. And if it's an omnibus survey, you, you pick the hot buttons that you think are going to get to the most population. If it's a dull and boring health care survey, you tell them why it's important to their health. Make them interested in it. A lot of different ways to push people's hot buttons. Oh, and by the way, it's not a sales call either. So our goal is to reduce total survey error. We want to, look, we want to entertain the notion of doing multi-mode surveys if we can. 
we use the language of words and graphics, and we know who our uh, we we have a working knowledge of several other things too. So to do that, it's a real quick uh, review of how people answer questions. Now, Lori, did, are you a coffee or a tea drinker? Coffee primarily. Primarily coffee. Did you have coffee this morning? Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> okay. Was it pretty good? Yeah. 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 How do you choose your coffee? Uh, at home. Yeah. Let's try dark roast. Dark roast. Okay. Why dark roast? Yeah, it's more, more intensely flavorful. Yeah, okay. All right. Now, Lori's over there wondering, why in the world is he picking a meeting? <laughs> okay, here's a guy. There's nobody else in the room. Check. Nobody else in the room. He's got a tie. Nobody else standing up in front of the group talking. And yet this, this quasi-status person is picking on me. And not only is he doing that, he's burdening me with open-end questions. <laughs> not even closed-end questions, like yes or no. So what's going through Lori's mind every time I ask the question? She's got to comprehend or understand the question. In other words, translate what I'm actually saying, despite my still nation southern accent, into some understanding. And then she's got to retrieve the actual information. Now that's a piece of cake here because it just happened here today. But what happens when you ask, in the past six months, have you ever? So she's comprehended what I'm asking. She's retrieved the information. Now she's got to make the judgment call. This is where the kids stop. Am I going to tell him the truth? <laughs> Is this sensitive information about my family's financial or sexual or criminal past? No? Okay. Well, yeah, I probably <laughs> got to go through all those steps. And then she's got to articulate it in a way that's important to her and that I can understand. And if we as survey researchers fail at any of those four points or introduce barriers in any of those four points, we're going to get error, or at least not as quality of data as we might, might want. <laughs> Measurement error. Let me show you how it works. It can be as simple as question wording, and we all know about the problems of question wording. We asked, um, we can ask it four ways. I did this in, oh, I don't know, early, mid-2000s, the Star Tribune. Over the course of the year, we interviewed about uh, 2,000 people, and we did split ballot surveys. And in a quarter of each of the polls, we asked a different way of asking party ID. We asked an open-end quest, uh, no, a closed-end question that's modified from the standard Michigan method. We read people a list, and we asked an open-end question. And what do you think the results were? They were quite different. When we asked the open end, look what happened to others. If we asked it standard, it was even worse. But if we read a list and included the grassroots party, the socialist workers party, the uh, green party, and all the other 12 parties that are active more or less in Minnesota, we got real different results. Point is two. One, Party ID is a state of mind. There's no hard and fast population parameters. Don't weight your data on it. And the other is party ID is a state of mind. It's an attitude, not a demographic. And it changes with how you ask the question. Did you use total then when you would want to describe it? Yeah. We did. Yeah. In fact, we didn't even analyze the data until after the fourth data, after the fourth uh, poll. Here's the questionnaire design process. Um, I want to mention one thing. Always do a stupid check. You do work. You do uh, spell checks and grammar checks. Do a stupid check. The last thing before you turn it over to your field work people, go call our colleague. Sit them down. Read the questionnaire. Even web questionnaires. Read it to them aloud. You will be surprised at how dumb <coughs> and articulate 
and error prone, your sterling prose has become when you try to read it out loud. And I don't mean to point fingers and accuse anybody in particular. I'm talking about myself, my own tarnished sterling prose. These are the sources of measurement error. I'm going to scoot on through because we're running out of time. Um, there are a lot of different places we can screw up. Uh, there are mode effects. You can ask exactly the same question with exactly the same scale, with exactly the same population, and get real different means for different modes, web and telephone. So let's go through some hints. For open-end questions in web surveys, use a single answer box when one answer is needed and more boxes if additional answers are needed. Well, that sounds smart. But how often do we program our Survey Monkey, or whatever we're using, Qualtrics maybe, to say, please tell us anything else about this topic you'd like for us to know about. And then we get a bunch of stuff, and we have to set up three coding fields, and then we have to decide how to code it. Pain in the butt. If we were just to do this, it would make it so much simpler. By the way, all of these come from Don Dillman's text on, uh, on uh, multi-mode surveys. Don has done so much experimental work on questionnaire design and question wording uh, that it puts all the rest of us to shame. He is, he is part of the reason why the U.S. Census in 2010 did such a good job, reduced re response rate, uh, or increased response rate, and was actually able to give money back to Congress. Align the answer space to size appropriate for the task. That makes sense. Get uh, respondents to give the proper units or format. Give them labels and templates. If you need dollars, put a dollar sign. If you need dollars and cents, put that in there too. Don't just say, how much money? Because then you're going to get even alphanumeric responses in there. <laughs> and you'll have fun coding those too. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Closing in question hints. Um, we've already talked about those. In fact, I should take these out for my class tomorrow. <laughs> um, I'm going to let you just read through those really quickly. This is one thing that I find really useful. If you've got uh, four uh, a, a liquor four point liquor scale, for example, and one of the responses that it, you're going to tag on is "I don't know," separate the four points of the scale by a space and put in "don't know" at the bottom so it stands out and people can see that. Put it over, if you're using a horizontal scale on your web survey. Put it over to the right. That works much better. Everybody remembers, well, maybe some of you younger folks. Don't. I spent many, many an hour at that on, uh, when I was doing my uh, master's thesis. Some self administered questionnaire uh, help. Use the language of words and graphics. Remember that? Use darker and larger print for the question text and lighter and smaller print for answer choices and spaces. That gives the respondent a visual cue as to what the, what the question is and what the answer is. Um, since you all have access to, the, to these slides, I'm going to scoot through these fairly quickly. Um, use spacing to help create subgrouping. Uh, let's see, another one. Oh, yeah. Use easy to read fonts. Don't use a script font. Don't use a serif font. Don't use monospace. That's the thing that looks like it, it came out of the 1987 uh, 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 DOS program that, that you probably still have to suffer with. Put special instructions into the question text, not out to the side or down at the bottom. Separate. Uh, optional or occasionally needed instructions from question text by fonts and, and other
other techniques. More hints? I had a research assistant one time that loved to cram as many questions on a page as possible. Plus or mark. We Southerners say that. I always wanted her to put more space between the questions than within a question so that the interviewers back in the paper and pencil days would know that when there was a new question starting. That carries through to web surveys too. Consistently identify the start of each question or section. That's important. Numbers are good. A separate line for the number might even be better. Anything you can do to reduce clutter, like little logos about your company or your department, get rid of that. Unless you really need it up front to establish trust. Don't put stuff side by side. You have a question over here that reads something like this. Um, did you use the following in the last uh, month? And if so, how many times? Yes, no, I used it. And then over here is how many times? Really bad design. When you stack them horizontally like that. Everything you can do to reduce respondent burden. Everybody knows the KISS principle, right? Keep it simple, comma, stupid. That's what we want to do. Minimize the use of grids and matrices. Keep wording simple. I'm really bad about using complicated multisyllabic words like multisyllabic. <laughs> and that's, don't do that on questionnaires. Okay, response. Uh, we know that um, we've had three periods of academic research in a non-response. The most recent one um, started about uh, eight, eight years or so ago, and it focuses on maybe 10 using mixed modes to mitigate non-response, and we're trying to measure the bias itself. We didn't know how to measure non-response until the 2000s. ASRO started it first. They came out with a pretty good definition of what response rates were, and then ACOR took it to the next step. I'll, I'll toot my own horn here. If you go to the ACOR um, website, aapor.org, you can download an Excel file that uh, all you do is enter the outcome codes for each of your sample elements, and it will calculate response rates for you. So real quickly, we know there's two kinds of non-response. There's item non-response, where you say, I'm not going to fill out my survey. And then there's uh, you, you know, <laughs> item non-response is when you say, OK, I'll help you out. I'll fill out the survey, but I'm not going to answer half of the questions. So that half that doesn't have answers is unit non or item non-response. Eleanor Singer, who's one of the uh, finest methodologists that we have in the United States, says that there's, we, we need to, uh, before we really address mitigating non-response, we need to understand why people respond to surveys. They do it out of altruism. They really want to help. Most people are pretty nice and want to help, particularly if they get some incentive, especially money, monetary incentive. And if they're okay with the survey characteristics, in other words, they're interested in the topic or they trust the sponsor and so on. So some bottom lines. All of you have had within your shops this debate. Do I send a paid upfront incentive or do I save a little bit of money and tell them we're going to send them something if they send out the, the uh, or if they return a questionnaire or the cheaper one, how about a nice iPad lottery? You all have had that debate. I know you have. Lotteries don't work as well as promise of the future, and promise of the future does, don't work as well as upfront paid incentives. Most studies suggest there's no effect of incentives on data quality. In other words, there's not a differential answer or differential responses according to whether there's incentives or not uh, on the question categories. 
there's no good evidence for how large an incentive should be. In general, the response rate increases the size of the incentive increases, but as you get to a particular level, it starts to level off. And incentives work differently for different people. For general population surveys, a dollar, two dollars, five dollars might work pretty well. For um, elite doctors, lawyers, and others, you, could, you medical researchers know that you got to really pay for their incentives. I need to jump in here just for a second. It is um, uh, twelve thirty, or I'm sorry. Uh, so um, sometimes for people who really need to leave, so we like to keep on time. So if you need to leave uh, now at this time, I think we have to move for another half hour. And so, and we'll I got about four more slides, so we're almost done. So this is a good time to take a break. Thank you. Thank you for trying to keep it. Okay. Any night, anybody needs to break, just file right on out. I won't take offense at all. Uh, that's just fine. Um, we talk. Uh, Eleanor talks a little bit about cost effectiveness. Um, generally, they can offset the cost of the survey, but not necessarily totally offsetting the cost of the incentives. What they do do is what they're supposed to do. Incentives increase your response rate. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip the waiting stuff. Uh, <laughs> you, you were really, you, you really wanted the waiting stuff. We can talk about that later. I'll keep the slideshow up. Um, when you evaluate surveys, how do we know when we've done a good survey? Were they comparable to other similar surveys taken at similar times? Just like Lori was talking about, we have the polls <coughs> taken at similar times, and we can look and see where the outliers are. Do they make sense when you just eyeball the findings? If I take my Mark I eyeball and look at my uh, frequencies, unweighted frequencies, and I see that I've got more liberals in Minnesota than I do conservative, I know I have a screwed up poll. Generally, I have uh, in Minnesota, doesn't matter how, it's, and it's been this way for decades, you have about twice the percentage of strong conservatives as you do strong liberals. I'll let you think about that for just a second. Did the survey use probability sampling techniques, including probability sampling at each stage, the household level and other levels? Were steps taken during the research methods to reduce total survey error and ensure validity? Did the researcher use the total survey error paradigm and examine the survey for each of the issues that we've talked about? And is the researcher willing to disclose or reluctant to disclose the methods and measures that he or she used? So those are those are good guidelines. They're not perfect. They don't give you if you have this and you've got a bad survey. If you have that and you've got a good survey, they don't give you that. <coughs> hey, we do hard work. It really is hard work doing this survey. I'll leave you with a couple of things. The world without bias is too hard. Would you just settle for a bit of world peace? <laughs> and finally, Sam Stauffer in Monsteller's 1949 report said something that's just very true today. With the improvement of these techniques, I think we can have every confidence that we're going to improve social science, and I think we're going to help our country because I believe in this work as an instrument of democracy. Thank you. I appreciate being here. Thank you. I appreciate you asking me. And uh, if you have any questions, Michelle. I have a question for you. Yeah. So I realize we're fortunate enough that we get lists from our customers. We do a lot of publication with this location. We have some of the mail We do a lot of mail service. We mail for plus two very few times. So the one kind of dilemma, maybe argument that we have is if you have 10,000 email addresses, should you just Survey everybody and get a lot of responses, maybe not the highest response rate. You know, if you get them quickly, you got or you go for a sample and hit them hard until you get a good 20, 30% response rate. What's the what's the best way? I mean, you can kind of argue both sides, you know. And clients that go for, you know, we want three thousand responses, they don't really care if the response 
Yeah, we, I, I'm working with a client right now having this exact same discussion. <clears throat> and here's, here's what I advise. Um, if you have a large enough population, a large enough universe that you can sample from it, then that might be the better way to go about doing it. Especially if you're really using incentives and all of the total design, total survey design, or total survey error techniques to reduce non-response, to reduce measurement error, and so on. However, um, if you have an only, a, a smaller <coughs> 3,000 or so, um, and you need four or 500 interviews to actually do your work, do your breakouts, your cross tabs, maybe regress, whatever analysis you're going to do, are you going to get that by doing a 50% sample you know, and a low response rate? No, you're not. So it might be better to, enter, to, to survey everybody. But the one thing that I would do, however, and it doesn't matter whether you use the sam a sample or you try to do a census, is build in some variables on your questionnaire that you have administrative population parameters for so that you can weight your data. So if you've got, uh, I don't know, your list of 3,000 and you know uh, what area of the country they come from, uh, what census area or state or whatever, build that into your questionnaire so that you know where people live here, you know where people here live here, and if that's an important thing then you can wait on it to make sure that you have um, the, the correct proportions according to region. That's just an example. So uh, I know that didn't give you the answer well, you wanted. Sorry, Right. Yeah. And and, and like yeah, I said, you can. Yeah. 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 Yeah.